All right, welcome back. Yes, we will uh, discuss the situation with the health sector. We are joined this morning by Dr. Lauren Ibermamora, Minister of State for Health. Good morning and thank you for joining us today on the program. Thank you very much. Good morning. Okay, but before we get into the health, just uh, briefly, uh, the retreat that ended yesterday with the, the ministers, the presidents, uh, the executive president there. Well, yes, we've heard the uh, excerpts of the president's speech, but what did uh, ministers leave there with? I mean, for your ministry, for instance, what were the takeaways in terms of performance and uh, what you intend doing in the ministry moving forward, which Nigerians can feel that, yes, indeed, this is what we're going to do to impact your lives. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chimbali. Now, well, the whole essence of retreating itself, um, first was to do a kind of uh, stock taking, you know, within the last uh, one year that uh, we've been in office, uh, got to see Mr. President appointing us into the, to his cabinet. So do a kind of uh, stock taking to uh, do uh, a kind of reflection of what had uh, gone on, what had transpired uh, in our various ministries in the last one year. And uh, also look at, um, you know, uh, retool, the need for us to retool and then re-strategize uh, for the future, particularly in the remaining three years, well, which probably will be more of uh, two years because of politicking that's, that will come in uh, uh, towards the end of the tenure. And in that regard, uh, for us in the uh, Ministry of Health, don't forget that we as consultants were brought in uh, who are experts to do the assessment and the kind of independent assessment and uh, look at uh, what we have done well, what we need to do more, and then of course setting priorities, particularly uh, this period of um, um, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, there would be need for us to reprioritize and uh, look at what the quick wins uh, can be within the, the health sector. So we have looked at all this and uh, well, what we have come up with essentially would be for us to um, beef up, uh, ramp up uh, the primary health care, which is the, 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 is at the base of the, the pyramid of health care delivery. Two is for us to um, increase our collaboration with the uh, other tiers of government, you know, the state, and of course, uh, through the state to the local government, and of course, to the communities. So we need to increase that, you know, that collaboration uh, for effective healthcare delivery. Then, of course, the, the uh, um, basic primary healthcare um, uh, delivery uh, fund a busy healthcare fund. We also need to operationalize it. And uh, this will help us to achieve um, the universal uh, basic uh, healthcare, which you know, really captures all that we want to achieve uh, within the health sector, you know, in terms of uh, uh, health promotion, in terms of uh, disease prevention, uh, in terms of treatment, in terms of um, um, rehabilitation, and of course, uh, in terms of uh, um, palliative care, because uh, the whole concept of universal health coverage yeah. uh, is captured on the on the on the on, on the, that. Uh, okay, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do um, how do ministries or the executive approach or relate with, for instance, when they uh, read the dailies or watch the news or go through social media and, and they see 
uh, people raise concerns about perhaps the economy or how they think that, well, it's not hunky-dory for them. They think they could be a lot better. The economy is tanking. In spite of what the executive may have done, how do you re approach that when seeing all of this and then people say, look, we don't feel some of the good things that you may have put in place? Well, the, the, the popular saying is that he who feels it knows it. Uh, those who really, uh, of course, if you are not, if you're not ill, you may not feel what it is to be ill. And if you don't go to the hospital, you may not, uh, uh, you may not appreciate, you know, uh, what we are talking about. That's why I said earlier on that um, we need to, the need for us to, to prioritize because uh, the COVID-19 has affected, you know, lives and livelihood of our people and it has affected even the economy, the economy of uh, virtually the entire world, or, you know, all the nations of, of the world uh, has been affected. That is why we need to uh, do some prioritizing and uh, look at what we can achieve uh, I mean, within the ambit of uh, what is available to us. And that's what we were doing, and that were issues of. Uh, that's why I mentioned primary health care, because that's that's where you have a lot of things. You have antenatal care, you have um, issues of nutrition, immunization, um, name it. Those, those are the basic things that we need to uh, to to. If, if if we have very functional primary health centers, and when we say functional, that is having all the. You, all, all, all the things that would make them functional, electricity supply, water supply, uh, the human resource for health, and the basic uh, or the essential drugs. Uh, these, are, these are the things, and these things, these things are there. And uh, you know that uh, the bulk of our people, they live, they live in, in the rural community, uh, communities. So that's why if you can take care of them, of course, um, it's less number of people that will require secondary care and of course, lesser number again that will require secondary care. So we need to focus on this and we need to also ensure that uh, as much as possible, uh, the, 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 the higher uh, levels of care, that is secondary as in the general hospitals and in the tertiary centers, as in the teaching hospitals and the federal medical centers, they are also functional. You see, if we reduce the, 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 the body, if you get it, right at the level of the primary care, we will reduce the burden at the secondary care. If you get it right at that level, again, we will reduce the burden at the tertiary care. One of the key takeaways from the, the retreat is the fact that the president said that, you know what, you need to package your information well, package your achievements well, so you can sell to the people that this is what we have done in the past one year and this is what will be doing moving forward. And I think it's also important to package maybe the KPIs, you know, because I, you said that there was evaluation and I believe that KPIs were given to the ministries at the onset saying these are the things we needed to achieve in this period of time. So uh, regarding the KPIs really, um, how much of them were you able to achieve? How much of them would you even be sharing with the public that this is what we're able to achieve? This is what we could not do because it's important in the packaging scheme, people need to actually know what is happening? Yeah. Now, I mentioned the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund, which is a provision of the Constitution, I mean, of the uh, National Health Act. And of course, we, 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 that is in place and we're able to uh, operationalize that because it is from that that, uh, because it has gateways through the uh, National uh, Insurance, uh, NHIS, National Health Insurance Scheme. Then of course, you, because that is once you can have um, the, the you can increase the, um, the the net, and they make the national health insurance compulsory as opposed to um, you know optional uh, situation that hitherto existed. Then you will have more people that the, the, the funds will be available to cater for. So and that is it's in it's in process right now. And it's going to be supported by the, uh, the basic healthcare uh, uh, fund. Then, so that is one of the things that you know has been done. 
Again, the issue of uh, polio. Don't forget that just a, you know, a couple of weeks back, we had that certification. And uh, you know, it's, it's something to rejoice about that uh, Nigeria has been certified uh, polio free. Uh, hitherto, we, the three, three nations of the world, uh, you know, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria, were in that uh, uh, unenviable uh, company. But we have exited now, and I think it's, it's something to, to, to cheer. That's part, of, uh, uh, that's part of the mandate that we were given, which we also achieved. Of course, we are also working on our, I mean, the heart, attracting private sector involvement through PPP arrangements. So we have so many of them going on in, in various stages. But the ones that we have achieved so far, we have PPP at the, you know, I mean, the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, you know, in, in diagnostics, which is there. And then that has been through the sovereign, sovereign uh, uh, wealth uh, investment. Uh, we have in the... Luth, we have in um, the Amino Kano uh, University a Teaching Hospital, and we also have in Federal Medical Center Umua here. And those things are there, which, uh, because it won't be, it won't one of the most important aspects in patient management is the ability to make accurate diagnosis. And you need these uh, tools, you need this equipment, you need this diagnostic uh, 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 tools to be able to make. Uh, accurate diagnosis. So that is also something that uh, we have done and um, it, it's there for, for people to see. Then, well, of course, even the um, issue of uh, taking care of the, uh, what you can call the specialization um, of uh, uh, doctors through the, um, through the residency training. Of course, we've been able to capture that in the budget and uh, uh, is to pay for the residency program for, of our doctors. Of course, that has, all, that has also been, been, been achieved. It's part of the uh, uh, you know, achievement of this administration through the, through the health sector. Um, yes, there are other things that we have, we, 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 we have on our uh, KPIs, but then which uh, the issue of COVID-19 has uh, uh, disrupted, but even the, as, as at that, we still, COVID, you know, may end up just being a kind of um, blessing in disguise because uh, if, if there is one sector that stands to benefit uh, with, uh, with this COVID, it is the health sector. And we can see that where they may not start manifesting immediately, but in terms of uh, uh, looking forward to, to the future. These things will start because we have so many hospitals, uh, isolation centers, um, um, uh, infectious disease hospitals being put up in uh, virtually every state. And of course, you, we have a situation now where we have um, um, the molecular laboratories being set up uh, throughout the country. And uh, probably all this wouldn't have come to be if we didn't, we didn't have uh, COVID. So these are some of the things in spite of COVID um, the, we're still, if I, that of polio, a program that uh, we, we still, we're still able to maintain in spite of COVID, which has a tendency to divert attention, you know. Uh, well, the, but we are still able to achieve that uh, as a polio free certification. Okay, so, so these are some um, of the things, of course, uh, we're still. We, all right, pardon me. Speaking about the resident doctor strike now, they say that all the demands since June 15th, none has been addressed, apart from a few PPEs that have been provided. And then one wonders, how can that, that be? Is, that, is not, that is not true. I can tell you that that is absolutely false. But let me start by saying first that uh, I want to uh, pay tribute to all the health workers, not just doctors, all the health workers that have put up very, you know, uh, uh, gallant efforts, particularly at this COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, period. Because this, particularly the frontline workers, be they cleaners working in the isolation uh, centers or the treatment centers, uh, you know, workers, health workers in the 
uh, emergency accident and emergency centers. Uh, then, of course, in the various, uh, even border post, port health services, because they, they are the, they, they are the, they are the first line, you know, uh, people, workers, you know. So I want to, I want to really applaud what they have done so far to bring us thus far. And secondly, is to say that uh, it is regrettable that we are having this strike action at this point in time. But having said that, the third thing is to, I also want to thank doctors and the other health workers who are still able to maintain some skeletal services, particularly at the treatment centers, at the isolation centers, at the emergency, accident and emergency centers, in spite of all this. But having said that, now, one, you see, it, 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 uh, we, we should get the facts right. One, we have been able to pay the hazard or the COVID-19 inducement, we call it, because we had to suspend the hazard allowance for this period so that uh, we can go into renegotiation after the... So what we said was that we were going to pay for three months, April, May, June. Now, we were able to pay... April, May fully. June, part of it has been paid, but not fully paid. And it's because of well, what we all know happening in our economy and uh, these uh, funds have to be sourced for one way or the other. And at the last you know, uh, count, we've been able to disburse close to 20 billion. And I repeat, close to 20 billion. So to say Mr. nothing it, has been done, that is okay. not true. If I could True. just follow up on that, now, pardon me. No, 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 let me... Let, no, so I, that you don't I, lose I your train of this. thought. I need to yeah, say this. You will, but I just need to follow up on that particular point so we don't lose it as you say the second part of yeah. it. You know, when, when, because they say, um, okay. first, hazard allowance that they've been seeking to amend that for almost 30 years, that is 5,000 Naira. So is it the 5,000 Naira that you say has been paid to some of those? And was it... Federal government that paid federal doctors, or has it been paid across board, including states? How did that? Uh, how was that carried out? Now, now, we, we, you see, I I mentioned earlier that we suspended the five thousand. You see, five thousand. What is five thousand? It's so paltry. This is something that has been in existence since 1992, 1993. So and that was why we had to suspend it for this period, so that we were not paying starting from about 50% of the basic, 50%, depending on where the point of operation is. That is, if you are working in the front line that I mentioned, you're working in the um, um, uh, treatment center for COVID, or you're working at isolation. So we, we had to uh, do the risk assessment that you if 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 you are if you are an account officer that you are not working, you won't have the same. But the, we 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 started the graduation from the front, which is fifty percent of their basic. So that's that was what we, we you know we did regarding that, and we then scaled it down to other 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 depending on our assessment of risk that each health worker faces at a given point in time. Now. So we, we've been able to, to do that for two months, April and May. June, we have started, but not complete. Uh, but we are still on it because of the limited funds. Of it. And I just told you that so far, 20 billion has been expended for this. And of course, because of the, uh, the shocks that we have in the economy, uh, as well as I mean, resulting in the low, uh, lower uh, earnings, there. We could not go the full hawk, but we are still sourcing for that. Then the issue of residency training program. This gulps four billion. It's been captured in the budget. It's been appropriated, but you know government processes tend to be you know it, it's somehow slow. So it's just the implementation in terms of uh, documentation and all that that remains. The doctors themselves can confirm that it's in the budget. It's been appropriated, and of course, it's, it's, it's just the nitty-gritty of uh, uh, release 
that is but, being worked out. But, you know, yesterday then, as well, pardon me again, my apologies. Which you mentioned. Yeah, they, they say that the question about it being in the budget, they also said that, that the ministry or the government has always tell them that some of these things are in the budget, year on year, I think for the past two or three years. But they usually don't get it at the end of the budget cycle. So if you're saying this one is in the budget, is there a definite date as to when they can access it? You see, no, no, again, that, 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 that is not true, this particular one, because the doctors, you see, what the difference this time around, or what we did the last time, was that we brought everyone involved on board. The Ministry of Labor and Employment, of course, the Minister of Health, which is the primary uh, ministry concerned. We brought the Office of the Accountant General, the brought with the Minister of uh, the, the, the Ministry of uh, uh, Finance, uh, you know, Budget and National Planning, the, uh, the National Salaries and Wages Commission. Uh, just name it. We brought everybody. We were all together, and we worked on these things, and everybody knew what to do at a given point in time. So the, the, that's, that's a major difference from what had obtained before. Everybody this time around, the doctors themselves were there. And the, 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 of course, NMA, NLD, all the bodies, they were there, the other all the professional bodies, uh, uh, pharmaceutical society, limited lab, the representatives were brought together and uh, you know, roles that uh, particularly on the government side that each person will need to play was assigned out and, uh, and uh, put in place. But like I said, this money has been released. It's now a question of uh, nitty gritty. Nitty gritty in terms of we need to know, we need to know who the resident doctors are in the various institutions. And it, it, it will have to be collected from these centers because somebody might start a residency program and probably not even, uh, not even there again, could have, could have gone out of the country, you know, for one reason. So we need to know so that at the end of the day, we are paying for those who are really under, you know, undertaking the, the, the program. So... To say that the, you know, it, 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 it's not like if it ever, ever happened at all in the past, it's not the same this time around because everybody was brought together. Then the issue of uh, the uh, PPEs, of course, um, you also mentioned that, where, that you know, they agree that that, that is no longer uh, you know, an issue because uh, it's been taken care of you know, uh, adequately. Then, moment, as uh, that, Honourable as Minister. The last engagement we had. J just one moment, if you don't mind. Um, you said earlier that yeah. there was uh, something that government had to do, take off certain uh, amount of money or certain allowances they were getting. You, you had to suspend it for a while. And of course, a number of other things yeah. came up. Was there a conversation with the doctors or the health workers at that time on that matter? Because, well, to you, well, the 5,000 may not be anything, but to them it could be a lot. So was there a conversation with them before that action was taken or any such? Yeah. Yes, there were. We had not just one, we had conversation, series. Because what we said was that, look, that amount could no longer even hold because of the, uh, of, of the amount. And uh, we, we, did, we didn't want to say that. We, what we agreed was that after the COVID period, we will sit down to renegotiate that because it will now be uh, a question of, uh, you know, emergency thing. Uh, we, we are taking care of the inducement, as we call it, COVID-19 inducement allowance for this period. That's what we said. And then we can then sit down to renegotiate the uh, hazard allowance, which is routine, as it were, quote and unquote, routine for the another 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 and, uh, issue I mean, that I think workers, not just yes. doctors. All right, that was another we, thing. We all sat down together. Yeah, another thing that perhaps uh, would be of concern would be whether or not it's the same thing at the state level as it is at the federal, because 
you know, not all of them are yeah. federal workers. And consequently, if it is happening at certain levels, one, our correspondent went to town and said that certain people got paid and certain people didn't. So if that conversation goes out, the assumption then would be there is something happening that they do not understand. So is this same conversation at, happening at the federal level also happening at the state level for all the health workers? Well, thank you very much. We have made it very clear that it is not proper, it is not appropriate, and it is, even, it is even unfair to visit the scene of the father on the son, or vice versa, or visit the scene of the son on the, on, on the father. The federal government takes care of federal government workers. We cannot, as federal authority dictates to the states, what to do? We can only appeal to them within the ambit of uh, working in the same system, that is, or in, this, in, in the same country. We cannot. We cannot. We can only appeal to them. But we cannot force. That is the truth that must be told. We have said that several times. And what we have seen over and over is that when this uh, strike action, you know, uh, gets on, then we, 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 it's lumped with uh, what the states are doing and FCT. The states and FCT administration, they are separate. They are not. We, we, the federal government does not. It is not within the contemplation of the constitution in a federal setup. Okay, so well, that is the well, truth. Uh, but we but can what, appeal to them okay. to... Con concerning that particular yeah, point, we would we'll, we'll we'll like them. you to... We'd we'll like you to shed a little more light on that, but that will be when we return in just a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with the Minister of State for Health, uh, Senator Olorunde Ben Mamora. You were talking about um, the states and at the federal level, but the doctors equally said, uh, I mean, some of their comments yesterday was that, well, some states have domesticated this act but they have not done anything in terms of implementation. They also say it is the same thing with the federal government. I think, if I remember properly, they did talk about uh, 2017, and that ever since then, well, the Medical Residency Training Act, which was domesticated by FG in 2017, has not been implemented. Is that correct? Well, that is not, that is not to my knowledge in terms of uh, what, you see, the point I've made is clear, which is that the states, yes, if the states, if some states have domesticated, we appreciate that. And that is, that is the advocacy. And you recall that at the commencement of this uh, engagement, I did say that um, we're working on collaboration with the states and through the states to the local government as well, and through the local government to the communities as well. And we have this engagement at various levels through the, through the Nigeria Governors Forum, which we, we meet with them, and uh, we want to we advocate certain things, and we encourage them to do, to do certain things. We also have the National Council on Health, where all the state commissioners of health are, are members, and we, 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 we discuss with the, so we want to tell them you know, what to do, I mean, how to collaborate and how to, uh, you know, have this uh, understanding for the good of us all. But I'm saying that uh, we cannot. It's just like the Child Rights Act. The Child Rights Act has been, demo has been I mean, domesticated in some states. But again, domestication does not necessarily translate into implementation. So it can, it can be domesticated, but the implementation will still have to. But in this particular one, it's uh, again, it's a function of the, 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 the ability of the states to. We appreciate that, where they do, because that's part of the advocacy, that's part of the engagement we have with them. But I'm saying Just that to now hold the federal government responsible, that is what I say is not fair. That's the point but, I'm making. Now, and the same thing goes for FCT. Now, you, yes, you also spoke about, the FCT. Just, just, just one moment, Honorable Minister, you spoke about the collaboration with the states now and that there is a National Council of Health that, is supposed, that interfaces federal and state um, health delivery systems. For the states and from the conversations you may be aware of, is it a problem of funding 
that they, the states have, which is making it impossible or difficult for them to remunerate their health workers adequately? Or what exactly do you think may be the reason, or you have found out is the reason that, you know, the sin of the son, as you said, is being visited on the father? Yes, you, you are right. You know, but my understanding or my own, yes, my own understanding is that of, uh, you know, non-availability of inadequacy of funds available to implement. That is the issue that I have seen with uh, the, 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 the states. It's not because they don't want to, generally, but inability, because they also have their own, they, they, they have to determine their own priorities. But we say that, look, health should come first. That is our own position, and we try to also make, and we do know that, uh, uh, at least uh, most of them, they really mean well and they know that they have to do uh, more in terms of uh, guarding the health of, 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 of the people of their respective states. Right. Just to put this in context, 16,000 doctors have down tools, basically saying that we are short-staffed in a sector that we were even short-staffed before now, 16,000 doctors are out. And you know, they, they put out their, their, their demands and they said that this is just resuming the strike they, they embarked on or they suspended in June. So they gave government 10 weeks to meet their demands. And one of the issues they raised, which is quite germane, is regarding insurance. They say that the, the doctors that lost their lives in the line of duty, that their families have not been compensated, have not been paid uh, that insurance till this point, and that's one of the issues that they raised. They said they've given government 10 yeah. weeks to actually meet this. So, and we know that there was that meeting with the Speaker of the House of Representatives at the federal level, and this seemed like it was sorted, but here we are right now. So regarding that insurance, what is the issue? Ah, uh, okay, yes. Now, every, every federal government uh, or every worker in the federal civil service is entitled to this group life insurance thing, which is domiciled in the office of the head of civil service of the Federation. That is a group life thing. And uh, we discussed this at our previous engagements with doctors. And we did say that you need to come up with this uh, uh, information to the, uh, and all the uh, relevant uh, officials, particularly at, in, in the office of the, uh, the, the uh, head of the civil service, relevant officials were present so that they, they will know who to direct these things to. What we just do in the Ministry of Health is supervision of the process. So when somebody... Uh, dies, a, a doctor, a health worker dies, and is an employee of the federal government. The information comes to us, it goes to our HR, Human Resources uh, our, uh, uh, Directorate, is processed. And of course, ours is to just do a follow-up. But in terms of uh, getting this thing done, it's through the office of the head of civil service. That's the thing. We just supervise and ensure because they are the ones that will interface with the uh, insurance company because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a group of uh, insurance uh, uh, companies that manage this, this, this process. But what we have discovered is that uh, most of the time, or some of the time, the appropriate information is not made available for example, we have asked the various federal tertiary hospitals in the, um, the, the, under the federal government to come up with a nominal role. So we know who is uh, on that list and stands to benefit if, unfortunately, that kind of thing happens. I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the event that that kind of thing, that is death, we know we can easily follow through. And like I said, our role in the Ministry of Health is that of supervision. It's handled and the thing is domiciled at the office of the head of civil service of the Federation. And they then liaise with the relevant insurance. But all the, you know, again, like I said earlier on, the documentation process 
and the bureaucracy and all that. These are some of the things. And we made that clear. And the, we, the, 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 the doctors told us that they understand better now. You know, I mean, I said that point in time. So, so talking that's, about, that's the thing. Right. It's not with us in the Federal okay. Ministry of Health. Well, you, you have talked about the, 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 the head of civil service, and we do hope that those issues will be resolved. But another issue they have raised, which you have talked about, is the inducement fee. You said, yes, uh, the, the, the hazard allowance has been suspended. Allowance. But you have, you have looked into inducement allowance now just to ensure that they are covered. But you mentioned that just part of June has been paid. So that's leaving the rest of June and August. And you, you, you said earlier on that you are trying to collate the list of the, the, the doctors. Is that something that is ongoing? What is the plan for paying those, those allowances? Because that is one of the issues they have raised. Yes. You see, we, we, we discovered that uh, from the list, because the, 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 the um, various heads of these institutions, they generate the, those that are captured because they are there. They know who works at the um, treatment center, who works at the isolation center. And, they, and of course, the, 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 the isolation and treatment, it's, it's, it's pay as you go. Because it's not every time that you have people working at the um, treatment center. You may, not you may not have even anybody on admission at the treatment center at a given point in time. So there will, be, there will, not, there will not be need to pay. So it, it's, it's, it's based on what they generate and send to us. But right, having but, but, said that, okay. I also do know that uh, we... Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, that we still have to source. You see, what we, if I, the initial computation we had from the ministry, from the records available to us, it was in excess of 70 billion initial computation. But we had to scale it down based on uh, other uh, realities. And when we took off in April, the Federal Ministry of uh, Finance, Budget and Economic, uh, I mean, National Planning, was able to source for 20 billion that they put down to cater for a three-month uh, period. But we discovered in the, in the process of implementation, mm -hmm. because we they were then having a lot of figures based on what we were also uh, giving from the various centers, we discovered that uh, what we had could only uh, cater for uh, a little above uh, two months, but not even reaching the entire three-month period. So that, that was how we got stuck. And at each point in time, we tried to explain this. And we were working. It's, 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 it's working, you know, in, in progress. Because it's not oh, as if the money is, yeah. you know, is stuck part, somewhere. No. Okay, part of the understanding we is... We do not pay the money. All right, part of what they we understand is the that... Pardon me, they were saying that uh, about some of this uh, COVID allowance that six out of 54 hospitals were paid and that the others have not received any payment. That's what they, they say. You see, you, you don't forget, it, it's not even the hospitals alone. They are, they, are other, they are other establishments that have generated uh, you know, uh, 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 figures, they have generated lists of uh, those of their staff that are in one way also involved. We have centers, you know, medical laboratory, uh, uh, you know, sent, uh, medical laboratory people in, uh, who are not necessarily in hospital, but uh, specimens are taken to them and all that. They, they are also exposed somehow. So we have so many other things that we are not even, uh, they were inadvertently not captured even at the beginning. But when, they, when, when these people now saw that uh, payments are being made, they, they now had to come up. And all this, we, we needed to interrogate and uh, be sure of uh, what we are pushing forward 
for payment. So th th this, these, are some of the, these are some of the issues. But again, but, the, the, the Federal Ministry of uh, Finance is sourcing, is uh, looking for you know, funds here and there to, to, to really pay because right. the so speaking is about there, right from the, the from, from the highest level of government and Mr. President is so concerned about all this and all we right. also we also working and, and speaking to, about to, the to funds see that we, we get this in so like that and we you, have you, continued you did say pardon me you mentioned earlier that um, twenty billion have been has been paid could you give us a breakdown who and who were paid this twenty billion. I have just mentioned from the various, from the various, the the the, the, the list of uh, uh, those that the, 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 that qualify, the list is is, is being generated all over across across the federal federal medical centers, university, uh, uh, federal teaching hospitals, uh, federal medical centers, other centers. You have uh, you have uh, neuropsychiatric centers. You have orthopedic hospitals. Uh, those, those are federal institutions, federal tertiary. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, health institutions that are generating all these uh, uh, figures, lists for us that we need to, to, to look at and then uh, 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 push them on to the relevant authorities for, for, for evaluation and uh, uh, capturing. This is what happens. So is, is that uh, the list that was being collated how far have you gone with that list? I mean, does NARD understand that, well, this is what is going on, and it's not just NARD, and then you have other affiliate unions, which we'll come to in a moment. Do they know that this is the process? Because if they do, one wonders then, why will they embark on strike if they have this clear communication from the ministry? Well, you see, Chamberlain, I can assure you that at each point in time, we carry them along. We let them know what is happening. And don't forget, there are, there are other issues that were raised before this time that we were able to resolve. Like the crisis in, uh, you know, in uh, University of Poraco Teaching Hospital, in the local chapter of, uh, you know, the, the ARD, Association of Resident Doctors of uh, the, the, uh, Potak I mean, the, the University of Poraco Teaching Hospital, with uh, the, 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 the NARD, the national body, we resolved the thing. The issue of uh, the, the, the University of Just uh, Teaching Hospital, we are the, the, the doctors that, uh, uh, by effusion of time, that is, they, 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 by time they, they, have, they have retired, that we, and then they, they were accusing us of, of uh, you know, dismissing them. No, we did not do that. What they, they, their time was up, but we now, because we had promised that those who will be retiring, rather than sourcing for fresh people to help in this COVID-19 COVID period, we had to reabsorb them into the system. So we resolve all that because those are part of the issues brought up in the, in, in, you know, in, in the, in the previous uh, uh, you know, months you know, leading to all this. So these are some of the things. So a lot of things come up which we look at and we evaluate and we, 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 we look at... Uh, the, the, you know, how genuine these issues are. And we try to do our best. In, and we have, at every point in time, appealed, and we are still appealing to doctors to just bear with us that <coughs> we look at some of these demands that are very legitimate and that we are doing our best to address them within the ambit of uh, funds available. We may, we may need because to be a little more. Are, just one are, moment, they, they, Honorable Minister. It's not minister. just doctors. That's why I, say I, I have yeah. continued to talk about health mm. workers. Yeah, we, we may need to be a little Health more persuasive workers, because I don't think that the message is percolating as one would expect. One reason for that is, I mean, while these issues with NAD are being addressed, Johesu has placed us on standby. They also have put out a notice that they're going to go on strike September 14. If by midnight of September 13, their demands are not met. In fact, some of the demands, according to them, date back some... 10 years, uh, they've been engaging on some of these issues since 2014, and that uh, it culminated on their uh, strike of April 17, 2018, and some of those issues have not been met. This time, they said there's a seven-day warning strike for all federal health institutions, and states should be on standby. Can we avert this? You, you, you see, th thank you very much. I can assure you 
that at every point in time, you, 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 I have carefully ensured that, you know, in terms of uh, choosing my words, I have not just talked about doctors. I have talked about health workers because I, am, I, I don't need to be told that, uh, you know, the healthcare uh, the delivery is a team effort and everyone that is in that team is important. So, you see, but what we have discovered is that the moment you try to solve one particular issue, some of these uh, you know, bodies, they, 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 they introduce another one. The moment you try to solve that, they introduce another one. So it becomes virtually you know, endless situation, which I want to say with all due sense of you know, uh, modesty and uh, respect, that that may not be fair to the system. That may not be fair to the system. We are looking at this. This, this I, I mentioned earlier, and some of these, these, these demands, they are legitimate. No doubt about that. But that we also need to show understanding within the ambit of the realities at the moment. There are so many issues competing for the limited resources available. What we now try to do is to prioritize as much as possible. And uh, ask for the understanding. That's why we, are, we continue to appeal to all the health workers, not just doctors, all the health workers. And that's why I want to really thank those doctors who, as we speak, in the introductory uh, clip that we showed, Lagos is there. They are working. They are working. No evidence of uh, any strike action going on. So it is this attitude of understanding. We are not saying that you know, they forgo what they, what they should earn legitimately. But we are saying that we also have a duty even to protect these workers. Johesu, we have a duty. Johesu in particular. From the uh, Federal Ministry of, uh, of Health. You know, for so Johesu. But we, we, we cannot do whatever on our own. We still have to liaise All right. with other ministries and agencies of government. Right, you know, so for Johesu in particular, they're they, they saying that they think the government is paying lip service to conciliatory agreements, which is why they're planning to go on that strike. And for them, they're saying that if those demands are not met, basically saying that we, we, we agreed on these things and they've not been met. But, you know, th there's a lot really to talk about in the health sector, especially now that there is, there is global health pandemic. And uh, I'd like to quickly touch on this one uh, just before a round of a lot of travelers uh, saying that they're not entirely sure uh, where to get tested, especially because of arbitrary test fees. This is some people are charging 42,000 Naira to get tested. So is there a standard fee for getting tested, especially for travelers who have to present, you know, their test results just, you know, a few hours before, before travel. So is there a standard fee for testing? Is it free? Where should people go to? Well, uh, we, we, cannot, we, cannot, we cannot talk about any standard fee because it depends on where you are taking it. They, because we allow some private, accredited private laboratories to do the testing. So if for one reason or other, a, a, a particular private laboratory decides to, to, to charge, uh, you know, 10,000 and another one decides to charge 12,000, for as long as there are private laboratories, we cannot, we don't have control over that. What we are interested in is that that, that lab, the private lab, has been accredited to carry out the test. That's, 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 so we cannot determine for them it way. It's probably the, the, the government centers that uh, they may, may if, if at all, they have to charge, they may, may charge uh, a uniform amount if they so wish. But we don't really have control. What we are interested in is to, pro is to, to produce a certificate of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID, uh, COVID free. That, that, that's, that's all we are interested in. In, in fact, when, when they hear 72, that's even not midway because I know some charge 75,000 Naira if you want your results real quick. So that's just as an aside. But could you tell us, what is government thinking about the vaccines received from Russia? Are we going to distribute it, administer it, or what? Well, Chamberlain, I, I, I think I, 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 I think the Honorable Minister uh, already issued a statement, and I also had to respond to some of, I mean, from some of your uh, media colleagues, 
we never, I repeat, we did not receive vaccines from Russia. What happened was that the, His Excellency, the ambassador, you know, the Russian ambassador came in company of the head of, uh, the deputy head of mission. He just to present aid memoir, which is a kind of um, diplomatic uh, uh, communication, you know, to Ross, to the effect that they already have a vaccine developed in Russia, which is undergoing clinical trial. That's gone through phase one, phase two, and now in the phase three. And they're hoping that if, uh, the, if it's concluded in the phase three, which is the last phase in terms of clinical trial, then it will be made available for use. And uh, that vaccine has not even been released in uh, Russia itself. So it's just for us to uh, be notified and uh, possibly indicate interest just in case it is certified. And when I mean certified, because even when a vaccine is produced, it still has to be subjected to our own processes here in Nigeria, particularly through NAVDAC. That's one of the reasons why NAVDAC is there. So no vaccines were brought to us. No, it is, I think it's, a, it's, it's a wrong information out there, which we have tried to, from that very day, since we got it on, on news, we have tried to correct it. So it is okay. not true. All the right, vaccine, then. when it may be as of today, you have about 230 vaccine candidates, you know, all over the world that, you know, various countries are working on here and there. But it, it, it's a cumbersome process. And even when, the, the, like I said, the, the phase three is the final, which will now, it will involve uh, several thousands of people because there are so many things to be checked. And when it's even determined in that, it will still have to come here if we, before we can, because this is something that we're going to apply to a lot of people, masses. So you cannot afford to take chances. And that's why NAVDAC is there to check for the safety, the efficacy, and across board, because it's vaccines. You want to know, is it just meant for children? Is it meant for adults? Even if it's adult, is, is it meant for a particular age group? Or again, do you, can you apply it in the presence of uh, comorbidities, that is, other existing illnesses? These are so many things to be checked before we, you can then push it out, out and say, yes, you, you can apply. Because it's, 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 it's vaccines, which means so many people will be, you know, it, it's, going to be a, it's going to be of mass application. So you cannot afford to take chances. We have not got to that stage at all because even the vaccine itself is not yet released in Russia. So how can we have it here when it's not even released in, in Russia? The uh, Russia, we, Russia is still in phase three of the clinical trial. All right, well, then I do to at least let them hear that from you again because some were already distorting and asking questions about that. So good that uh, you shed a lot more light on that. Well, we do hope that the meeting goes well today with the resident doctors and that uh, even Johesu as well will sheath the sword moving forward. And thank you for talking to us today, Minister. Thank you very much for inviting me and I thank you for also helping us to put the, you know, the, 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 the situation in the right perspective and hearing from us as to what we are doing. We want to still appeal to all our health workers to please bear with us we are doing the best we can in the circumstance to also uh, protect their own interests. But we also want them to understand the situation in which we are in. All right, then. So Thank we you. will be back in just a moment. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, a lot happening in different states as regarding security. But how do they all concern the Constitution? Will, can there be a solution from that perspective? 
Well, first, we've got um, Alwa Rafson Jani, who is the Executive Director, Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, that's CISLAC. He joins us from our studios in Abuja. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Well, when we see stories saying, look, uh, CSOs are pushing for devolution of power, more powers to states, as uh, some of them did report this morning, asking that uh, they legislate on things like aviation, banking, mining, prisons. We understand CISLAC is also involved in this. Could you share some light why and the thinking behind this? Thank you very much and good morning, uh, viewers. As we all know, since 1999, Citizens Forum for Constitutional Reform, which is the biggest um, national coalition that is uh, agitating for the reform of our constitution, given the kind of uh, contradiction, inefficiency, and the lack of effectiveness, as well as you know, perception of uh, unfairness that has been in the country, right from the military regime up to when we had uh, 1999 election. So Citizen Forum for Constitutional Reform is an umbrella of, um, you know, uh, many civil society organization, traditional, you know, um, groups, you know, all non-state non actors have been involved in the Citizen Forum for Constitutional Reform. And from 1999 to date, it has carried out a lot of, um, uh, you know, programs for us to look at, you know, how a constitution should actually look like in order to meet the aspiration of um, its citizens. We also engage at local, state and national level to get the views of Nigerians on how they want this constitution to be uh, reflected. A lot of work has been done at different levels and we have came up with you know, a model constitution, which, you know, uh, if uh, it has been adopted, will have helped to address so many concerns, so many problems that Nigerians have been uh, having and expressing. So CISLAC has been part of this, you know, effort of the Citizen Forum for Constitutional Reform. Uh, there are quite a number of issues that we believe the states must handle in this country in order to ensure more efficiency, more effectiveness, and also reduce this, you know, too much um, fight or too much agitation over, uh, you know, what is contained in the, at, at the level of federal level. Because you have so many agencies, you have so many things that really you need to, you know, um, give powers to the state that should handle. And therefore, we believe that the only way we can uh, bring about, you know, um, inclusiveness, uh, fairness in the states of Nigeria is to ensure that, you know, certain level of powers are actually given to the state and local government. As it is today... Ongoing debate. Whatever you want to do, for example, in terms of security, right. you will discover that you have to get approval from the federal. Okay. And it doesn't seem to work. There's no way, you know, um, a commissioner of police in Casina that will take any initiatives without directive from uh, the federal government when the, security, when the state is, you know, under siege. The same thing also if you are in Patako, in uh, Anambara, or if you are in Ogun State. So there's need to look at how we can redesign, you know, uh, this constitution. Unfortunately, all this effort that civil society and Nigerian people have been making since 1999 with a huge amount of money for both the executive and the legislature to do constitutional amendment. You cannot account for anything. All the billions that have been spent from 1999 during Ubasanjo, you know, up to date, you cannot see anything because of the self-centered, you know, interest by some people who are not, you know, interested in allowing Nigeria to actually, you know, uh, work for the benefit of Nigerians. So and that brings us to the next point, really. Effort Mr. Sure Rapsanjani, that, you know, that brings us to the next... ...is done in order to make Pardon the Nigerian me. state to be more efficient, more effective, more productive, and to actually give a sense of belonging, and to give more accountability 
Because without this constitutional amendment and without devolting powers to state, it will be difficult to actually you know, um, ensure more accountability and even get the state to professionalize in governance. Because even though some people will argue that even with the powers that the state has, it has been you know, uh, abused or not managed very well. Okay, but let me come in here, Mr. Rafsanjani, because you have, really raised, you have raised an issue about you know, successive uh, reviews and possible amendments. You said we've spent billions. Don't forget there's still that debate on whether we should actually even review this constitution. Some say, well, why not refer to previous CONFAB report? But regarding the items, because this is going to be a major part of this, re regarding the items on the exclusive uh, legislative list, about 68 of them, how do you propose we go about it? Do you have a list of items, I think, for now, these ones should be on the concurrent list, or you just think everything should move to concurrent? So at least we know that Every, every, every tier, as it were, has equal powers, in quote. No, we are not proposing that every tier, uh, federal government, state government, and local government should have equal um, powers or responsibility. What we are saying is that there's need to discuss, there's need to dialogue, there's need to see where we are not really making progress because of the over-centralization of powers and responsibility at the federal level. We need to look at those things. And you know, at the level of um, uh, civil society, and even at the level of national conference, you remember in 2014, Jonathan organized a national conference. And even in that national conference, the resolution that came up was to really look at some of these powers that the federal government has to you know, actually bring them down, down to the um, state in order to make Nigeria to be more efficient more effective and more fair and have a sense of responsibility or sense of belonging. As it is now, we are not saying that every power of federal government should be uh, shared or should be, um, you know, uh, taken to the state, you know. No, we are saying that there are some key important, you know, um, areas in our constitution that if you devote it to uh, the state, the, even the competition the violence attached to the presidential election will have been reduced because part of the problem we have with our electoral system is because people believe that once you become a president, you will do anything that you want to do with the country. But if you, you know, reduce some of those things and give it to the state to be responsible, you will see that the overheating of the polity would have also been reduced and you will make the state to be more efficient more accountable and more competent, qualified, responsible Nigerians will also go to the state and local government to buy for position. But now everybody is looking at federal government All because right. that's where you you know have everything. And it, because of the absence of also uh, responsible accountability or leadership, you yeah, know, it Mr. Afanza, ju just one moment on what you just mentioned. Now you just mentioned the fact that everyone is looking to the federal government, and perhaps rightly so or not, especially when it comes to security. Now, how significant do you see this arrangement, this devolution of more powers to the states? Uh, how significant do you see that on security, given the fears that people have that if you give more powers to the states, uh, the state governments, uh, as far as security is concerned, security personnel is concerned, uh, those things could be politicized. Is that factored into your consideration? Um Yes, it is true. There's this uh, legitimate concern and fear. But, you know, when you are doing the you know, constitutional amendment, when it comes to the aspect of the security, you would make it in such a manner that, you know, uh, there would be, you know, occasion when there's a feeling of threat, there's a feeling of repression and oppression by a state governor. There would be something to checkmate him or her, you know. So you look at what is happening in other countries, in the, you know, you know uh, globally. In the U.S., you have, you know, uh, federal security, I mean, federal police. You have also state police. And where there is um, clear evidence of bridges of fundamental right of the citizens, you know, definitely, you know, um, the federal will come in, you know. But there are certain, you know, security, internal security threat remaining the state. And if the police or the governor cannot act, cannot give directive to deal with those problems, he has to get directed from Abuja, then really by the time they came, many people will have died. Many destruction will have happened. So what we are saying is that 
you know, as we are giving, you know, responsibility to the state, we are giving them more accountability and we are calling for strengthening also the state institutions. Because if you then strengthen the state institutions, you know, it is true, the fear that some people are having, it might be possible, but it is only when Nigerians are not active, are not interested in governance. When Nigerians are not interested in how they are being governed, they then demand for accountability. They then demand for responsible leadership. All right, Mr. Rafsanjani. Just abuses to happen. Let's take that. Let's talk a little further on that security perspective. Let's bring it back here. We've got uh, uh, Colonel Francis Okosun, who is a retired military officer, to, to just give us his perspective. Now, we've seen uh, some recent developments at Katsina, Kaduna, Benue, and different parts of the country previously. Now, from what he is talking about, ensuring that states play a lot more role in the scheme of things, how do you see, what kind of impact do you think that if they do, will it affect or improve the security situation? Thank you. Um, the security situation as it is today is not uh, for one tier of government, one interest to, to consider. It's an all-commerce thing. It's a society-based thing. The way we have had it so far has not been too satisfactory, and that means that the way we've done it it's not been the best. Therefore, what do we do? Um, currently, the way the military is postured, the way the security apparatus is postured, is not uh, having a salutary effect on the situation. Therefore, we have to sit back, sit down, and examine the way things ought to be. So when we do that, what should run topmost? Because, look, without security of lives and property, a lot of things will come to a screeching halt. Well, um, the practitioners will tell you that, as it is, strength, that is the numbers, will lack the numbers. The army, the police, the air force, civil defense, they all lack the numbers. Training is lacking, equipment is deficient, and morale is very, very low. These issues must be looked into one way or the other and as expeditiously as possible. Perhaps one challenge that would also come in that mix would be that of collaboration. First, among the tiers, just as you have the various agencies of government, just as you have said, but then now, and among the tiers, uh, Mr. Afsinjani is talking about devolving a little more power, a, few, a little more power to the states, uh, so that they can tackle their own primary uh, security. And of course, he also mentioned the fact that there is a need to, to understand where the powers of the federal government are uh, get to in terms of security, and where the powers of the state governments get to. The example of the dreaded uh, militant in Benue State is one that's a little bit. Um, that you may want to explain what could have happened and how we can stave off such. On the one hand, the military is saying that this man was, you know, taken out in a firefight of some sort. And meanwhile, the governor is saying that, no, it didn't happen that way. He, they were already surrendering. So how does this kind of situation affect our security uh, challenges, uh, and um, how can we stave it off? Because it would seem there is either lack of coordination or lack of communication. Here again, the blame game thing won't help. You see, every state government, every state governor has responsibility for security needs in their state. However, the question to ask is, are the state governments in a position to handle security? Are they in a position to deal with the emergent threats? Are they equipped? Do they have the financial muscle? Do they have the will? And I challenge any state government, governor of government to come up to say that they can handle even the policing in their respective states. They cannot. We tried, they tried Amoteku. They, they came up with the Amoteku thing in the Southwest. And only last month I heard a governor ask for how to pay the salary. I mean, that's, that's, um, that's, that's scandalous. If you touted this Amoteku thing so much, so loud, so long, uh, only to come 
a few, a few weeks later to begin to ask for how you're going to pay, then you can now take it a, a notch further. Just, just one moment uh, yeah. uh, before you go. Uh, is it a problem of capacity or constitutional empowerment to take on the issue of security in each of the states? It is, it is it's a case of sincerity. It is a case of altruism. The truth is, what is the threat assessment? What have you come up with? And then how do you provide the solution? Nobody has come up with the solution. All I hear is we want state police, we want powers devolved to the, to the lower level so that we can handle our security challenges. But the truth is, no one has put down a framework how to get this done. I was talking about the police, um, state police sometime ago, and I asked, where do you train the state policemen? Who is going to train them for you? Is it the same police, the same decrepit police colleges and training schools that we have today? Is that where you want to train? I think Chinese Television a few years back ran, ran um, something on uh, the police college in Ikeja. I mean, it was a scandal. Is it the same police college in Ikeja that would train the Lagos State Police? Or the state police schools, training schools that would train the police in the states? We are just not serious. And if I might add here, how does any state hope to equip a police service? Now, a policeman standing in full service marching order will take at least between $1,500 to $2,000 to equip. And that includes kit, uniform, weapons, ammunition. So, how many policemen do you require in Etios local government, for example, in Lagos, or my Eastern West local government where I come from? Mm -hmm. None of less than three to 400 policemen. Multiply that by $1.5 to $2,000. Change it to Naira, and then tell me how many states can afford that in mm -hmm. the current circumstance. Yeah, putting that in context really just paints a picture. But re regarding the, the, the statement about paying Amotekun, which you referred to, if it's that statement that was made by the Onto state gov governor, I believe he was saying that if they have to pay community police, which is an initiative of the police at the, at the federal structure. I think he was referring to that, that, well, he's not sure that they can pay that. He's saying that they can handle Amoteko, but not that community police initiative from the police. But, you know, back to the, 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 the incident in Benue State. So, I mean, you have said this is not a time for blame game, but it's important to look at these issues because I think you presented an opportunity for collaboration between the state governor and the military. And what the state governor is saying is that, well, the military was aware that he had granted amnesty and they were being transported uh, to where they will be received and all their arms will be deposited. But apparently, it appears as though the military did not get that memo because it eventually turned out into a, a, a gunfight and eventually we know what happened. So, do you think that was a missed opportunity? Well, um, not being on ground and not having had the result of the investigation that will go into that, it will be difficult for me to sit in the studio here and tell you what, ought to, ought, what might have been or what ought to have been. However, there's, there's always there's a always, um, need for cooperation, coordination, and liaison, which is not being done properly. That has to be done because at the end of the day, everyone is a loser, the way we are going about it. And um, the earlier we get to the drawing board and sort out this problem, the better for everybody. All right, let me get to uh, Mr. Rafson Um Now, if the legislate on aviation, mining, will then still be a need to focus on security uh, because, I mean, you would have freed up some funds in terms of the economics and as such, idle hands may get a lot busier. What do you think about, particularly in context of what uh, Colonel Coulson has said about providing for security in terms of the state's handling it? Well, uh, you know, we have to understand that, you know, we are, our democracy is evolving. And uh, because we suffer, you know, um, from lack of democratic, you know, uh, experiment for a very long time, and even when democracy came, uh, you know, there has not been some, you know, continuity or sustainability and, you know, also having uh, in all the times and all the places the right person and caliber in place. Uh, outside putting personal interests and all these uh, quest for uh, looting uh, that many people in the leadership position at different tiers of government they have inculcated in their mind and mindset. So we have not had opportunity to dialogue 
to discuss in a real and practical ways on how we can handle this, you know. And that is why all these agitation are coming. And because of the over centralization of powers and also abuse of this power, even at the federal level, you know, that is why all these, you know, uh, demands are making, you know. Now, in terms of, you know, uh, the security, you know, um, framework that you talk about, it is part of the dialogue that we are talking about. Let's first sit down and discuss. Let's see what is possible. Nobody is proposing what is impossible. Nobody is saying that, you know, we should give responsibility to the state, you know, when we know obviously they cannot, you know. But let's begin to have conversation. Let's identify the problems. Let's see how we can deal with those, you know. So when there's no such opportunity, then you allow people to come up with all sorts of uh, theories, with all sorts of speculation. So my own, you know, uh, view here is that let's use the opportunity that we have now to further discuss. We have had series of conferences, resolution, you know, agreed from both, you know, different interest groups. But implementing those in a problem. Just to take the example of the 2014, you know, um, conference report, which I was privileged to be there, you know, as a civil society representative. We came up with all sorts of recommendations, debated them, agreed with, you know, uh, on those uh, uh, recommendations. And not only that, put those things in form of, um, you know, three, you know, um, forms. One, that has to do with the constitutional amendment, which you require constitutional amendment. Other one, it re require you sending those issues to National Assembly to have a bill on them, and the National Assembly will legislate on them. All right, the Mr. Rapson, Johnny. Really a policy issue what the president has the power to handle. So, uh, but I, I guess those things we are not considering. Bottom line, and of what you're saying is um, ideas have got to contend. It's a democracy, and at the end of the day, superior ones should have the day, uh, perhaps if they have the numbers as well. Exactly. All right, we do thank you for exactly. talking to us. Uh, our Raf Sanjani, Executive Director of CISLAC, as well as uh, Colonel Francis Okosu, former military officer. Thank you for your thoughts as well. Thank you. All right, let's dive right into the feedback that we're receiving from you. Let's see uh, what you think about some of the issues that we had raised uh, previous. Yes, just before <laughs> to, uh, today, as a matter of fact. But this one is coming through from uh, Taiwo from Ilori. He says, COVID-19 has taught them no lesson. Whoa. It cost the government nothing to standardize the health sector if they want to give the common man a good life in this country. Hmm. Big one there. And this one talks about uh, performance assessment. Henry says, on performance assessment of the administration, where do you situate views of the people of Nigeria, their ultimate employers? Please, how many states have the basic health care fund been dispersed to? Just two questions, he says. If uh, what uh, the minister and the president said about coordinating, giving us good information is anything to go about. It goes back to what the minister said the other time about the primary, secondary, and tertiary institution. There needs to be tiers of health. There needs to be a timeline on how that's going to be done. But this one is from Professor Enakana. It says, government at all levels must invest in health infrastructure and its practitioners. It's one of the salient sectors that must not be assuaged by pettiness and political navish tricks. States must cooperate and work with government at the center to avoid impending strikes. Our Oshino Kings says security of lives and property remain the key responsibility of any government. We'll do ourselves a whole lot of good if internal security apparatus are taken mm. off the federal government and only external security is left mm. in their care. Same for roads mm. and <laughs> others, he thinks. So thank you all for your comments. We'll see you all tomorrow. I'm Chamberlain Uso. I'm Kyle Dukikulu. And I'm Ayo Makinde. Have a wonderful day and please keep safe. Mm -hmm.